Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Heritage on this quite chilly morning. Um, we're glad that you're here to worship with us, and we are excited to um, see what God brings to us today as we come to him in worship. To get us started, I have a few announcements. Uh, we want to remind you to sign the worship pads on the end of your pews um, just to help us keep track of who's here and who we need to check on. And um, if you have any prayer requests, your prayer needs that you would like to share that way, you can write them in on your pad and um, we will look at those as a staff. Um, we also want to just say a big thank you to everyone who gave blood this past Wednesday for John's mom. John is our youth minister. Um, his mom has been um, battling cancer for the past several months, and um, we do want to announce today that she went home to be with Jesus on Friday afternoon at about 5 o'clock. Um, so John and Kara are in Brandon um, with their family and taking care of things. And um, the funeral will be held. Um, they're having a family-only visitation and then 2 p.m. graveside at Crestview Memorial Gardens in Brandon. That's um, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Um, so we just want to continue to lift up John and Kara and Molly and Julia and just the whole family as they continue to grieve the loss of Miss Marcia. Um, we also want to remind you the office will be closed tomorrow in observance of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. And on Saturday Jan or Sunday, January the 30th, 30th, we will have infant Bible presentation and state of the church, and that will be a combined worship service in the sanctuary. Um, if you have had a, an infant born in the last year and you haven't received a letter from Miss Edith about that, um, just contact one of us. We want to make sure we haven't let any babies slip through the cracks in the past year. Um, and finally, next Sunday at 2 p.m., from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the hospitality room, there will be a diaper shower in honor of uh, me. I don't, I don't know how to say that. Um, but, um, but a diaper shower. Scott last week made sure. He said, I don't know why Harry's name isn't included in that. It's a diaper shower for him, too. So it's a diaper shower for Harry and I um, as we wait for our new baby on March the 10th. Um, so I think those are all of our announcements today. Um, let's have a quick word of prayer as we move further into worship. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for an opportunity to be in your house where it's warm and where we're surrounded by the people we love. God, I ask that you would comfort those who are mourning the loss of, of Miss Marcia today, comfort John and his family, and let him know that we are here and that we are ready and willing to do whatever it is to help them through this time, Lord. Um, we also pray for those who are sick and who are out with COVID and pray that you will heal them and bring them back to us and back to um, their normal lives um, very soon, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you guys to stand, and we are going to join together in our responsive reading. And I will lead us, and then your response will be on the screen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Mercy. Thank you Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Merciful Jesus, thank you for a new creation. I will give them an undivided heart and put a strong spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Merciful God, thank you. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Merciful Jesus, come and renew the spirit. Amen. Uh, I invite you to remain standing as we sing hymn number 64. Can I sing hymn number 64, holy. 
holy, holy. remain standing as we affirm our faith together by means of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our time of offering, we are reminded of the privilege and honor we have to steward the resources God has given us. Uh, those of you who are watching, there are notes there uh, in the comment section on the side about how you can give electronically. Uh, but we're going to ask the ushers, if they will, to take up the offering at this time.
As we come to our time of pastoral prayer, uh, I want us to take some time. Today's message is around the peace uh, that God brings us and brings us relief and refreshment in life. I want us to take a minute in this time of prayer to kind of just exhale. I feel like uh, for the last two and a half years, this has been one of those hold your breath seasons where it feels like there is this relentless siege of wave after wave, of crisis after crisis, of situation after situation. And there is this deep sense of fatigue and stress and anxiety and even fear that has uh, wormed its way into our lives. And it's as if my grandmother used to say, we're on our last nerve and um, we need some relief. And so what I want us to do today is just pause and understand that we have a God who can give us that. A God who is capable of walking into a storm, walking through the waves and finding us to kind of calm the seas. And I think sometimes we are so caught up in the chaotic rhythm of our everyday life that we can't just be still and know that we're not in charge of the universe, that there are lots of things we cannot control, but that we worship the God who can. So I invite you for a moment of silence and then prayer together. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we have to confess that it is hard for us to be still. It feels as if our lives have been under siege. In almost every facet, we struggle with the COVID pandemic, with supply chain issues, with political unrest. We struggle with wave after wave, and it feels as if the walls may not hold. And so we have walked around, many of us every day, bearing a cumulative stress that has eroded away not only our energy, but our faith. And so our prayer today is very simple. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew within us a right spirit. Intervene in the midst of this chaotic place and hold us in your grip of peace and grace that we might exhale and with confidence understand that though we cannot control the ebb and flow of things, You are ahead of us in ways we can never see or understand. Give us faith to live into that every day. Lord, we are so grateful that your vision of life is not some swirling whirlwind but rather green pastures and still waters.
Teach us to learn to graze in those. For we pray all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our song of consecration is number 347 in the hymnal. It's uh, verse 1. It's also on your screen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 7 and 26 through 28, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. The companion, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I told you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I give to you not as the world gives. Don't be troubled or afraid. You have heard me tell you, I'm going away and returning to you. If you loved me, you would be happy that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our sermon series has been fresh air, and instead of starting the year with a bunch of resolutions, we're looking at principles that kind of allow us to get a new breath, 
to kind of catch our breath, to, to find ourselves reinvigorated and re-energized uh, in life. As I said earlier in the prayer, one of the things that I just see in the faces of so many people is just kind of fatigue, just kind of this tiredness. It's almost like, will somebody stop and let us just take a nap? Let us just be still and rest and, and let our minds be cleared and let our hearts be centered. Um, it's the same look that I know Jesus saw as he taught in his time. He would gather on a hillside and look out on the eyes of those who had come to hear him, all of them yearning for one thing, some relief. Jesus could see their frustration. He could see their lack of trust. He could see their fatigue with the ongoing, just constant pressures of life. And he understood that somebody had to give them some relief. As I was getting ready, I, as a preacher, one of the things that you do is you have all these stories and jokes that you log up over the years, and you don't get to use them all the time. And sometimes you don't use them because you're afraid you've told them before. And sometimes it's because your wife has told you not to tell them. And sometimes it's just because you forget them. But as I was getting ready for today, I was thinking about a story. And you've heard this, but sometimes it's fun just to hear stories you've heard before of the young guy who decided to become a paratrooper. And so he signed up and went through all of his training, got through basic, and then went into jump school. And when he had finished jump school, the moment of truth came and that was everybody got on the plane for the first jump and so he lined up and they all took their seats in the plane and as the plane began to take off the sergeant got up and he began to go through the drill all right men you prepared for this your whole training it's very simple when I say you stand up you clip uh onto the line when you get to the door you jump out uh, you count to 10 if your chute's not open uh, then you reach over with your right hand and pull it if it does not open then you reach over with your left hand you pull your emergency chute when you hit the ground you get on that truck and you come back to base they reach the right altitude green light went on everybody clipped on the line Soldier after soldier went out the door. It came his turn. He jumped out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No shoot. Reach over with right hand. Pull. Still no shoot. Reach over with left hand. Pull. Still no shoot. And as he was tumbling down, looking at the ground, he said, I bet that truck's not there either. <laughs> I kind of feel like we've been in that season where it's been disappointment after disappointment after disappointment and, and you finally begin to get in this uh, kind of sense of anxiety and fear and distrust and nothing can be depended upon. And it's into the midst of that that Jesus comes to us and says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. My peace I give to you. Now, peace has a lot of connotations. And so I went to the internet and found this little um, kind of definition of peace that's both scriptural and so forth. So I want us to, do we have that video? The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, 
wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end, a time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. I love the idea that peace is not just the absence of conflict. You remember early on in his Sermon on the Mount, one of the Beatitudes that Jesus gave was, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. One of the gifts in the midst of the confusion and chaos and brokenness of our world is the gift of shalom. If you dig deeper into the definition, then a lot of scholars think that the root word was born out of the concept of the beginning creation of the garden. That whole order of good, that in every step from the beginning, God made things and said it was good. God made things and said it was good. God made things and said it was good. And when he was finished, it was all good. And it was shalom. And then... We broke it. And we've been trying to figure out how to put the pieces together for all of history. I guess probably one of the most difficult parts for me as a preacher is whenever I thought of myself as somebody who had the peace of Christ or a peacemaker, I took more responsibility for that than I should have. If you watch the video, one of the elements of the beginnings of Shalom is humility. To begin to understand that there are a lot of things we don't have control over. And in my life, what I've discovered is my highest anxiety always comes when I think I have more control over things than I do. Or when I think I can control things that I can't. And part of the message that our faith brings us is this. 
We were not made to manage the world. We were given a life. And how we live into that life is the thing we can control. And so as I was preparing for today, the question kept coming to my mind, so, so how do we make peace? How do we not only have peace that Christ brings us, but how do we become peacemakers? And I kept circling back to one simple prayer. How many of you know the serenity prayer? If you want to know how to be a peacemaker, then that's how you learn. God, grant me the peace, the serenity to accept what? The things I cannot change. What can you not change? Oh, there's a long list. The sad thing is, is we spend a lot of energy in our life trying to change those things that we cannot. We can't change how somebody else feels about us. As much as we wish we could. We can't change the circumstances we're born into. The list is almost infinite of the things we cannot change. And yet, I would dare say that if we were to do some kind of uh, chart of where we spend our energy and our thoughts, we would find out we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to change things we cannot change. I always used to get frustrated. Um, my assistant, when I was at the conference office, when I first went there, one of her litanies she said again and again and again was, it is what it is. And in my center, I was like, well, it doesn't always have to be. I can change that. And what I began to realize was is that there's a deep wisdom in understanding there are some things I cannot control. It is what it is. But the second half of what she said I missed. She said it is what it is so we do what we do. We do the things we can control. In our lives, we would do well to stop thinking that we have power beyond our power. That we would stop thinking we can control other people's lives or how other people react to us. And begin to think about what we can control. You remember the story of Jesus and Peter in the boat in the storm? The waves are beating, the sea is rough, the disciples are scared. Jesus comes walking across the sea. Peter looks out and sees him and is so inspired by the power that he said, Lord, I want to come to you. So he gets out of the boat and he starts walking towards Jesus. But what happens? The waves overwhelm him. And Jesus reaches down and pulls him out of the water and walks him back to the boat Jesus is the one who then controlled the waves not Peter we can't control COVID We can get vaccinated and wear a mask. We can't control the political unrest that's in our country. But we can live lives of integrity and do what's right ourselves. We can't make Russia not invade 
China not take advantage of their economic control. We can't undo the supply chain. But there are some things we can do. Which brings us to the second part of the serenity prayer. Give me the courage to change the things I can. As I was getting ready for this sermon, I began to think to myself, holy smoke, if I just spent as much time on changing myself as I've spent on trying to change other people, I'd be a different man. Think about that. How did Jesus put it? Why are you so busy looking at the splinter in somebody else's eye when there's a log in yours? Part of the wisdom that Christ seeks to bring us peace in is that Christ has given us one arena in which we have free will in. And that arena is our own life. The decisions we make, the character we build, the relationships we have, all of those are in our control. And oh, by the way, directly or indirectly contribute to our peace. And then we think about the last part of that prayer. And give me the wisdom to know the difference. You know, when you first hear that, that seems like the logical conclusion. But really what that last phrase is saying is an act of submission. Jesus says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. But as God gives. The way we decide what's manageable and not manageable in our life is to trust God and his Holy Spirit. Notice in that scripture, Jesus talks about giving us the gift of the Spirit that helps us live within ourselves and at the same time live within the wisdom of God. That's where peace is found in that wonderful equilibrium of understanding how small we are and how great God is, of what we can control and of what we can't control, we find this place that is a place of rest, a place of submission, not resignment. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God always has a mission for his church to be about the transformation of the world. But it's only in the wisdom of God that we understand what those frontiers are and what those things are that we need to do. As I've wrestled with this scripture all week, I've tried to do a little assessment of looking at all the time I spend and in what arenas I spend it and ask myself, are those decisions bringing me peace, putting me together, bringing shalom to my life and healing the brokenness, or am I breaking my life apart myself? Did you hear what I just said? Am I breaking my own life apart by how I'm living it? So, where do we start? Let me confess. 
I could use a lot less TV news and a lot more walks with Charlie. Because every time I turn that news on, I'm drawn into this idea that somehow I can do something about that. Now, I'm not talking about avoiding reality. What I'm really talking about is how much do we need to see this again and again and again and again? And how much does that play into our own need to try to fix or control or become angered by what's going on? And so I'm negotiating with myself exactly how much time I'm going to spend watching the TV and online and how I'm going to schedule that in my life. I'm trying to come to the conclusion that I could probably use a little morning check-in and an afternoon check-in and then check out. The other thing that I've decided to do is create more space through prayer and Bible study for me to learn the wisdom of God. For me to begin to let the Holy Spirit help me draw my boundaries. Help me focus my attention. Help me spend my energy in the right places. Because truth be told, when I'm left to my own devices, I'm terrible at it. And my life reflects that. And the relationships of the people around me reflect that. See, what I've, I've come to understand is, is by becoming a peacemaker, we make peace with our own peaceful presence. If you know somebody who is truly a peacemaker, who, who, who has shalom within them, whose lives are as complete as they can be in that moment, their very presence brings peace with them. They bring a calmness. They bring a centering. They bring a patience. They bring a thoughtful wisdom that's not built on some frenzied dealing with the onslaught of information and things that are going on in our life, but rather the simple, calm walk with God that allows them to make every decision with their hand in Jesus' hand and not the wringing of their own hands. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God, give me your peace, not as the world gives, but as only God can. Let us pray. Dear God, we have to confess that in some ways we're almost addicted to the chaos. That we have been suckered into believing that we are the masters of the universe. We've become scared of silence and stillness. We've become addicted to social media and entertainment. We've allowed ourselves to become skeptics and cynics.
And because of that, not only have our spirits suffered, but our communities have suffered, our relationships have suffered, our world has suffered. And so please help us not be troubled. Help us not to be afraid. And help us to understand that the way to shalom and peace is to follow you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You have left us a legacy of peace. You've given us the promise of peace. And you have sent us your Holy Spirit to keep us at peace. Make us children of God. Let us be peacemakers too. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is uh, a hymn that, that uses the word we've been using, Shalom to you. It's, this has always concerned me. How can there be a number 666 in the hymnal? I think they should kind of skip that, like the 13th floor in a building. Uh, but it's number 666 in the hymnal or it'll be on your screen. Let's stand together as we sing our invitational hymn. This is also a new hymn. So let me sing it through one time and join me on the second verse. As you marinate in that, spend some time this week just inviting God to help you find your peace. I feel like as a people, we've been just angry and hurt and tired for a long time. And so, just sit down. Put your feet up. Breathe in. And take the peace that Christ offers us all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So go and live loved and live in peace. Amen and amen.